Friends, today's sermon is the second part of a sermon I began last week that I called The Greatest Love Story Ever Told. And I'm calling this one The Greatest Love Story Ever Told, The Sequel. And it's still examining that, that most famous gospel passage, John 3, 16, that talks about how, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. And, and as we're thinking about that, today what I'm doing is I'm going deep into this idea of atonement. That is how we may, are made one with God. And we're going to look at this love story again from another angle and even go back a little bit earlier than the love story of God and Adam to the love story that is Trinity. And so friends, as we come to our gospel passage today, the John, the third chapter, verses 12 to 19, let us come again to God in prayer. Gracious God, we do thank you for this word that you have given to us, that we can use this word to know you, that it does point to you. God, we pray that, that you would open our hearts and our minds to see you, to receive you, and to be able to be grateful, Lord, for all that you have done in your triune nature, to make it so that you can be with us, your, your most beloved aspect of creation again. Thank you for purifying us. Thank you for forgiving us. And thank you for what you have done in Jesus and it's his name that we pray. Amen. Beginning at verse 12, this is Jesus speaking, saying, If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So last week I did, I, I told the beginning of the greatest love story ever told, and I called it the story of God's love for his people, beginning with God and Adam. And so God created humanity to be in relationship with us. But Adam and Eve, what did they do? They chose rebellion. They chose to eat from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in so doing, they lost their innocence. Sin entered the world and the taint of sin was upon not only them, but on the entire creation. And because of that, now they could no longer be in the presence of God and live. See, God's holiness, it automatically destroys sin. Like even if God doesn't want it to, much like Light always dispels darkness. Light always conquers darkness. There is, there is no darkness that is so dark that it can overcome light. Just as, as no sin is so egregious that, that God's holiness cannot conquer it. And so for a while, God was able to be with his people through temple sacrifices as God resided in the Holy of Holies at the most inner sanctum of the temple in order to be present with his beloved people. But God longed for the day when he could be with his creation in the way that, that God had always envisioned. As Genesis talks about how God would take a walk in the afternoon through the garden just to be with Adam and Eve. But the temple and that sacrificial system, that wasn't the end of the love story. But before I get to the end of the love story, I want to go back to the beginning again, except this time even further back than the story of God's, God's love for Adam and humanity. And it's the before even there is any creation at all. And it's truly the oldest love story. And it's the story of Trinity. You see, God would exist in relationship with God's self in this triune nature, three in one. And now we call each part of those parts Father, Son, and, and Holy Spirit. But, but these names, 
they don't do justice to the essence of who each member of the Trinity is, but we, we've assigned these labels to them as a way of trying to give us a sense of understanding and the way that the Father acts like we understand a Father, the way that a Son acts in ways in deference to the Father and yet in complete equality to the Father and the way the Holy Spirit moves. You know, St. Patrick, he tried to explain the Trinity with a, the image of a three-leaf clover talking about how like each aspect of a clover is distinct and yet they are all one together. So, so like we call Jesus the Son because that's the best way that we can understand his relationship to the Father, but he's not a son of the Father the way that I'm a son of my father, the way any of my, my boys are sons of, of, of mine. Like he came from the Father. He's completely equal in every single way. The essence of the Father dwells fully within him, but the Son has always existed. There has never been a time when the Son, as we understand the Son, the second member of the Trinity, there has never been a time when the Son was not. And the love of the Father and the Son begat the Holy Spirit, who, who once again is fully God in an all essence in every single way. And so these three, they exist in one loving relationship with one another before there is any instance of creation. Now, of course, the Trinity, it wasn't something that was really understood in the Old Testament. And we actually only see fledgling understandings of it in the New Testament. But we do still see elements of the Trinity from the very beginning of Scripture. At the very beginning of creation, God says what? He says, let us make humanity in our image. And I've often wondered if the author of Genesis might not have understood what he was even inspired to write. But, but there's this plurality there to be like, what? Let us not. Okay, let us make humanity in our image. Our God is actually a God of love because he has always existed in this state of love with other elements of the Trinity with Father loving Son and Holy Spirit, the Son loving Father and Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit loving Father and Son. And, and this is why we, we don't say that God is loving as an attribute. He actually is the trait of love, as that is embodied in relationship in Trinity. And you know, God wanted our love for Him to be a reflection of this love, this perfect love. But, but because of our sin, we're separated from God. And so the only thing that had been able to unite us with God was the sacrificial system in the temple. And like I said, it, it's working. I mean, at least it's, it's better than it was before, but it's still not Eden. It's still not God being able to take a walk through the garden each day with his creation. That chasm separating God from humanity, it was huge. And you see, the taint of sin, it, it was on all human flesh. It was, it was on all creation, and it, it permeated us down to the core of our being. You might even say it's, it's somehow embedded in our DNA. And no amount of animal sacrifice could change our DNA, could change us and who we are as a species at the core of our being. Our, our flesh is still tainted, our spirits are tainted, and they're bent towards rebellion against God, our maker, and towards our own selfishness. The mark of sin within us often is selfishness. So humanity needed to be remade, to be transformed from sin and death into this newness of creation. But, but so much sin had occurred throughout all of human history that before God and humanity could ever be one again, humanity had to pay the debt, the price of that sin, and, and to be purged of all of its sin. But, but we didn't have the power to do this ourselves. This, this was not a situation that, that we, in our own strength, had the capability to fix. Only God had the ability and the strength to do that. But the, but the problem still, remember, is that God could not be in the full might and glory of God in our presence because his holiness would automatically obliterate sin the same way that light destroys darkness and it would therefore destroy us, the very being he created, 
and was looking to restore. So it looks like this, this catch-22. Like, what are we going to do? Only a human owes this debt of sin. Only a human needs to pay it because God has not sinned and has done nothing wrong. And yet, only God had the power to pay the price. And we ourselves never could. So what do we do? What could we do? You see, what had to happen to fix, to fix everything once and for all was that humanity, our, our flesh and our spirit and our will, had to be perfectly and permanently merged with the God who is holy and divine and perfect spirit without form. So one part of God's triune self, the part that we understand as the Son, the Son took on flesh in the incarnation, was completely merged with humanity in the person of Jesus. And so Jesus is fully human in every single way. Because if he weren't fully human, he couldn't bear the weight of our sin. He couldn't pay the debt and take that debt, that blood price onto himself. He couldn't owe and stand the, the debt of sin and, and, and stand for us to pay that. But he is also at the core of his being fully God. And because he's fully God, he has the power to be the perfect sin offering for us. Now, now, in order to be fully human while on this earth, Jesus had to take some limitations onto himself on the expression of his divinity. Like, like now that he is completely enfleshed, the Son, he gave up something that he had enjoyed previously, and that is the ability to be completely omnipresent, present, present in all places at all all times, outside of even time itself. He gave up having the full mind of God, full omniscience, fully knowing everything there is, because the frailty of the human mind could not handle having the full knowledge of God. It like melt our brains. Now, the essence of who he was, though, was still fully God and equal to God in all ways, but he took limitations upon himself so that he could be fully human. Because without these limitations, his humanity would be compromised. It, it, it's an imperfect analogy, but I thought of something once, and I'm like, this is, this is good, actually. I think this kind of explains it. Like, imagine if we became a snake, like, and, and we're trying to, to work with the snake people and, you know, speak to them and lead them or whatever else. And so, like, we can't do it here, so we have to become a snake. Now, if we were a snake, we wouldn't be able to walk. We wouldn't be able to talk. We don't, we don't have arms to use. We, we wouldn't be able to even laugh or, or cry or do any of the things that, that we think of that make us human. We wouldn't have a human brain anymore. We, we became a snake. But at the same time, the essence of who we are, the core of, of who you are as a person, that would still be maintained with you as a snake. You're still you. You've just willingly given up some of your powers and your abilities in order to be a snake. You see, that's exactly what it was like for the second member of the Trinity, for the Son to descend from limitless power and divinity as one part of the triune God, and then to take on and enmesh himself fully with humanity through the person Jesus. But Jesus is still fully God in all ways in his nature. And Jesus has to be fully God, because if Jesus were not fully God, then he would not have the power, once he has taken all the sins of the world upon himself, to defeat sin and death, to rise again from the dead, and thus, from his death and resurrection, permanently transform humanity's relationship with God back to what it was like in a pre-fall, pre-sin entering the world state, where God and humanity can once again live in one another's presence and not for us be destroyed. And all of these things took place for us on the cross. Prior to the cross, Jesus revolutionized our understanding of God. Like he gave us a more complete view of God's nature than, than we as humanity had, had ever had before. To the point that if you want to know more about God, if you want to understand God, 
Look at Jesus. Jesus is what's called the primary revelation of God, the first way that God chose to demonstrate who he was, the main way, I should say, the most important way that God chose to demonstrate who he was to all of humanity is through the person Jesus. So look at Jesus, and that tells you more about God. And yet at the same time, this nature, the way that he lived among us, taught and reshaped what it meant to be human, all of that would have meant very little if Jesus had not accomplished the purpose for which he had been sent. Not just to teach others about God, not just to show others this great God that because of our sin we can't be with, but instead to demonstrate that love for us and to accomplish our atonement on the cross. So you remember in the temple system, a person would bring in an animal who would die in their place, who would shed blood as the price of their sins. So the person would, would lead the animal into the altar and place his hands on the animal's head. And the person would pronounce their sin over the animal. And while holding that animal's head, the priest would, would sacrifice the animal by slitting its throat. And the death of the animal and the blood of that animal would provide your atonement, your forgiveness. And so for a little bit, you found the forgiveness of your sins through the blood that was shed for you. The same thing's happening through Jesus on the cross, but in a much bigger way. Now, now I understand all of this. It is a weighty subject. And there may be some of you guys that's like, Evan, this is so deep. You've, you've kind of already lost me. But I hope a lot of you are like, oh my goodness, this is kind of making sense to me in a way that, that I never thought of before. Hold on to that, because I'm just going to be honest. This next part gets, gets heady. But, but let me also say, it should. It should. Why? Because God is so big and so beyond our comprehension. So much more than anything we could ever ever create that that if our theology makes absolute perfect logical sense then i hesitate and say if it makes sense to our little human brains it's probably because it has been an invention of our little human brains whereas if it's a struggle if it's hard if there's parts of it that just have to forever remain mystery then that speaks to a divine truth given to us by a God who is so much larger than ourselves and yet who has chosen not only to work in us, but to demonstrate who he is to us and through us. So, so God's not bound by anything. He can exist everywhere in space as well as everywhere in time. For God, there's no such thing as the past and there's no such thing as the future. Now, now we, we are bound by time because we are finite creatures, but God, God is outside of time and everything for God is what's called the continual present. That means that every moment of creation from the very beginning of time to the, to the cross, to the, the eschaton, that is the end time. So the very, very end, all of those things are the continual present to God experiencing all of those things at one time. And so while Jesus may have been on the cross at Calvary almost 2,000 years ago, for God, that moment is continually happening. And so instead of a person pronouncing their sin on an animal, especially, or essentially rather, declaring that, that animal guilty of sin and worthy of death at the cross, it is God who is outside of time, who essentially is like laid his hands on Jesus and pronounced the burden of all sins of all humanity for all time on Jesus. So every sin that had been committed prior to Calvary and every sin that will ever occur until the end of sin itself, all of that is being placed by a God who is outside of time and experiences everything as the continual present. It's being placed by God on Jesus. And so that's how Jesus' death paid the price for our sin and by his blood, no longer the blood of an animal, but the blood of the Son of God, we are now able to stand before God innocent and blameless despite the fact that we ourselves do still sin because Christ's blood has paid the price for our sin and Christ's blood covers us so that when God sees us, he doesn't see our sin, he sees the holiness 
of His beloved Son. And so we are restored to perfect relationship with God through Jesus so that we no longer have to die. Like this is the real meaning of John 3.16. God so loved the world, and, and that means you, that He sent His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. And this is the greatest love story ever told. And if you follow along with all these points, as God's great love for humanity has been revealed, beginning with creation and culminating in the cross, if you've followed that, then you should also have an understanding of why it is that salvation comes through Jesus Christ alone. See, if we had the power to save ourselves, then we wouldn't need Jesus. God would never have needed to send his son to sacrifice himself and die in our place. God, God would not have to put himself through the continual torment and separation that this part of God does eternally live through as God is taking sin after sin after sin that we have committed and placing it on the beloved back of his son Jesus on the cross for us. Like if it were possible for humanity and God to be reunited and restored in any other way, if there were any other means that God could have done this with, don't you think God would have chosen to do that instead rather than, than this terrible death and suffering that the son of God had to experience? But nothing else could do it. Nothing else would bring us together. There is no path that leads to reconciliation with God other than through the person Jesus Christ. Any other path that does not include Jesus is actually that same worn out path of human effort and human skill, which is always going to fall short. Like human skill, it's like trying to jump across the Grand Canyon. Right? Like, now there are some people who can jump a whole lot further than others. Like, the world record for the long jump is like 30 feet. Okay? So, like, let's say that world record holder's running and I'm running and we're like, we're going to make it. And that guy goes 30 feet and I, I go three feet. Okay? It doesn't matter that he's 10 times better than me. He's nowhere near crossing the chasm to land on the other side. It's the same way with the chasm between humanity and God. It doesn't matter how many good works you could have. It doesn't matter what your faith in anything other than Jesus is like, even if it makes you 10, 20, 100 times better than any other person, you still can't live up to the standard of holiness that is God. And this is why we have to have Jesus. Now, I know that's not a popular sentiment right now. and It doesn't, it doesn't give you the warm fuzzies. But if everything that I've laid out these last two weeks is true, and I think it is, I think it's, I think it's kind of like moving a, a crash course in Christianity 101 to Christianity 401 to really understand creation and temple sacrifice and Trinity and, and atonement and, and Christ, uh, forgiveness for us and the cross and all these things. I mean, it's, if all of those things are true though, if Jesus had to be the perfect sacrifice as the only one who could be fully human and fully divine, then it's only going to be through Jesus that we're made right with God. And so I would say Jesus is not a way to God. Jesus is the way to God. It's not something that, gosh, it's great for me and maybe not for you. No, no, no. Jesus is the Son of God, the only way to God, the method that God has established to lead people to salvation and through whom we may find eternal life. But you know, love, as we wrap up this, the greatest love story ever told, the sequel, love's only actually love if it's free, if it's given freely, if no one forced you to do it. I mean, like no one's forced you to love your spouse. No one's forced you to love your children or for your children to love you. It's, it's meaningful because it's freely given. And because of that, just like in the garden, God has given us a choice. We have the choice in whom we choose and how we choose to live our lives. Often, I think sometimes we, we think like, oh, I'm choosing Jesus. And I'm sure you have at some point. But we need to choose Jesus every day. And I fear that most of the time what we choose is ourselves. 
Most of the time, I think we choose ourselves, our comfort, our preferences, how we want things to be. And we can mask it in all sorts of religious language. But if anything we do ever seems like something Jesus would not have done, then are we choosing Jesus? No matter what justifications we could offer, no matter how it is we want to defend ourselves, when you look to the person of Jesus, the one that I've already said is the primary revelation of God, the primary way God has chosen to show us who he is, when you look to the person of Jesus, can you imagine Jesus declaring his rights to be more important than anything else? Can you see him on the cross? or before the cross, I have the right to life. I have the right to liberty. I have the right to do whatever. I'm not going to that cross. And then where would we be? Part of what it is to choose Jesus each day is to choose to sacrifice ourselves for others and for the benefit of others, even if they never appreciate it, just because that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And so every single day, let us Let us have the gumption and the courage and the humility to choose Jesus. And by choosing Jesus, we choose life. So friends, become a part of the greatest love story that's ever told. That story between you and your triune creator, the one who loved you so much that he gave up his life, that he sacrificed himself so that you and our triune God live together forever. Amen.